Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this latest teaching session in the class on technology and the future of medicine. Today is the promise and perils of artificial intelligence, part three. And uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Sony Ibo robotic dog for five to seven minutes, and then Russ Greiner is going to take you through a presentation toward patient-specific treatment, medical applications of machine learning. So uh, the Ibo is a very popular feature of this course. You can watch uh, videos of many of the interactions with it from previous uh, semesters. And uh, here are, are the various features, the sensors, and the various cool features that it had. This was in uh, October 2005, when the last production run was. So you can imagine, in the eight years since then, if they had kept on producing these, what they'd be capable of today. Uh, they play soccer, but uh, they play soccer on their uh, elbows. It doesn't really work for them to play soccer standing on their feet. So that was how robo soccer uh, matches were conducted um, using these. And uh, they can keep going forever. They sense when their voltage is low, they can find the charging station. If you have it within view, they will charge themselves uh, like sleeping and then get back up and, and keep on keeping on. And uh, it, it, it's, it's very similar to you guys, you know? <laughs> uh, constant activity except when you're sleeping and recharging. So they can really keep going forever. I have two of them, but my life is uh, chaotic enough today. I didn't want to run the risk of bringing them both. So when we have the evening uh, presentations, the student talks, the, the first of those, which is, uh, I think, November the 7th, uh, I'll, I'll bring both of uh, the IBOs at that time. Now, artificial intelligence may seem to you like just another subject, but it's actually by far the most important area in the course. If you think of existential risk, it probably is the greatest existential risk that we face. And um, you may think um, that uh, because of its importance, all AI researchers would believe in the coming technological Sing singularity, but they're as variable as normal people in that belief. And so some don't believe in it at all, some believe in it fully, and there are all sorts of shades and variations. So it does not naturally follow that all AI researchers are believers in the technological singularity. <clears throat> you can read about AI in books, but I think uh, interacting with the robotic dog this morning, it will be a memorable experience for you that makes it a little bit more vivid than just AI as a kind of abstract concept. It's amazing how much of a relationship you can have with that dog. Um, it asks you if you're tired. It tells you that he, that he loves you. Uh, I mean, all the things you want to hear from a friend. He never says anything unkind or that would be insulting or that would hurt your feelings. But the conversation is varied enough that he continues to be interesting to talk to. If he always said the same things, <laughs> you get pretty tired of him. But he's got a constant... Uh, Variations. So the, the, the software is really quite impressive when, when you consider that it was produced in 2005. Now, many of you are familiar with what it's like to live in Canada and the difference between living in Canada and living in other places, but something you may not have known is how unsuccessful the IBO was in Canada that no one bought the IBO. The first one I got, I was able to purchase here. But the later ones, 
the sales in Canada stopped because nobody was buying them. So the only way you could get one, unless you were an AI researcher, was to fly to the U U.S., go to a hotel, have the IBO delivered there, sign for it, and bring it back to the U.S. Because Sony has these buying around rules that you can't buy from Sony U.S. if you're living in Sony Canada. So I, I made some trips like that in order to get these guys. Um, and you may wonder, who is this for? And the answer is, it's for affluent young women. That the demographic, even the men who bought this product, bought it for the young women in their lives. And uh, so in the countries where it sold well, it, it was mainly uh, affluent uh, young women buying it in uh, Japan and uh, Western Europe. Um, it's not practical as a child's toy. The ears and tail come off in seconds in the hands of a child, and it looks extremely stupid without the ears and tail. And um, so it, it really, I mean, in a funny sort of way, when you think of adult toys, you have today experienced an adult toy. This is a toy for adults. Um, and you may wonder about cultural differences. In the United States, most AI research is related to defense and saving soldiers and winning wars. But in uh, Asia, a lot is uh, devoted to uh, elder care. So the most useful robots for you will, like this one, come ultimately from uh, uh, Asian culture and will then take, take care of uh, the elderly and you do useful things in the household. But that uh, AI research is, be, is being done on the other side of the world largely and not locally. Many of you know the, the classic film Blade Runner. But the replicants in Blade Runner were flesh and blood biological creatures, so they are entirely different from this sort of silicon and software based. Um, the um, AI in the movie AI, though, was silicon and software based. So that's all, all I have. Any questions about this? You'll be seeing the IBO again at least one more time in the course, and maybe twice. Okay, so now we're going to switch over to Dr. Greiner. I'm very grateful to him for presenting. So I'm going to talk about um, towards patient-specific treatment. This is a body of work I've been doing over the last several years uh, with various medical collaborators. Um, again, I encourage people to ask questions. If I can see people through the light there, I try to answer them. I should say also that I see that this is in the caption of perils and promise of AI, this is very much not the perils, but the promise. And maybe not just the promise, but the deliveries of things that have happened in the medical applications. But let me actually start by talking about machine learning in general. So machine learning in the large is looking at ways to find and use patterns in data. And that's useful for many technologies to help web navigation search engines, AdWords you see in companies such as Google or Yahoo or Bing. They all use machine learning technologies. Other companies that have employed it, <coughs> can you see these slides? I guess, yes. okay. Companies like Netflix try to figure out what movies people will like based on the other movies they've liked and other people who have seen similar movies. Um, Facebook, LinkedIn, eHarmony. eHarmony, in addition to finding people who like movies, they find movies like people, right? They're trying to find compatible pairs of people. Again, use machine learning ideas and technologies. So major, major multi-billion dollar companies have all been using these technologies. It's been used for other things. I can remember, it wasn't that many years ago, that, that natural language understanding was just a dream. It couldn't possibly happen. Yes, we can do little examples. We can play chess by saying pawn to king four, and that was about it. But now we have, we have cell phones that have Siri on it that can understand without any prior practice, any prior treatment, they can still understand it and do amazingly well. To understand some of the problems, one of my favorite titled papers 
oops, is, is this one. Sorry, look at my a paper titled, well, this is a paper on speech recognition. Why is this such a perfect title? Anyone in the room have an idea? <clears throat> Can someone say that out loud? Say it a bit faster. Faster yet? How to recognize speech. This is exactly the problem. You have interesting f sounds, and somehow these programs can figure out how to find the word boundaries and do it. And this is the title of a paper on, on showing some complexities, sort of saying why it's probably not going to happen in the near future. And yet, here we are with Siri and other tools that are used in, in all sorts of, of cell phones. Uh, um, other applications uh, to control power plants and robots and drive cars. Um, there was a talk in, I think it was actually this room uh, a year ago, by the, by the fellow who designed a car that could uh, drive through a desert that, could, that won a competition to drive effectively. It learned how to drive effectively, in this case through a desert, by just trial and error, by seeing, by getting reinforcements. And of course, the same person then worked for Google, and those cars that drive around and take pictures, not of people, but of houses and of streets, are using technology that was developed, again, using machine learning t tools. Just a side note, the same fellow, Sebastian Thrun, since it started Udacity, looking at, at courses. So again, which is also going to be using machine learning techniques to try to figure out how to coordinate these MOOCs, these huge classes with, with hundreds of thousands of people. How do you have a study session with this? How do you do the grading? How do you have chat rooms? That makes sense when you have this numbers of people. Again, machine learning is a tool for that as well. Uh, there's been other applications for, for playing games. Um, has Rich Sutton spoken yet in this class? Okay. Yeah. There are tools that were developed by many people, including one of my colleagues, Rich Sutton, to, to play games like Backgammon, a famous example of, of success in that, or chess or poker or other things have all been done. <clears throat> They've also been used to suggest new insights in areas for chemistry or biology, for looking at, at uh, the celestial objects and categorize them as stars versus galaxies versus, versus gases. How can you find patterns in interesting scientific data as well? A very famous example, and again, normally I would point, can people, can people recognize the, the, who's on the bottom right corner of the slide? No one here plays basketball? Oh, we're in Canada, I keep forgetting. That's Michael Jordan. Um, he won six championships when he played on the Chicago Bulls. And they won largely because of his prowess and ability. But also, there's a tool that IBM developed that helped, um, <clears throat> that helped sports teams to figure out that if, you know, if the person that Scottie Pippen is guarding scores fewer points than Scottie, that's a good measure to try to win. Um, and the first adapter of this, the first, the first organization that followed this, were the Chicago Bulls. Now, of course, if you've seen the movie Moneyball, have people seen that movie? Same idea, they stripped it down to a very simple thing and put it, in, put it in baseball, but that idea of finding patterns that can decide how to get the information you need to help you win games is something that's been around for quite a while. So all these are application areas. Another very exciting area is the area of medicine. I'm gonna talk about what machine learning can help in medicine. So, a quick survey, just to get a sense of the audience. Uh, how many people here have heard about things like correlations and mutations and cat hedge and catenin complexes. Anybody? Yes. And there's a doctor in the room who I assume have, have seen these terms. Multiple myeloma and bond party correction. All very important ideas and things I'm going to skim over because I want to talk about another approach. I want to talk about, instead of correlation, I want to talk about classifiers and talk about tools used such as decision trees and um, just like overfitting that comes in in a tool called Weka. So I'm gonna talk about this body of tools. So as a quick outline of what I plan to talk about, I'm gonna first give an example of learning to predict breast cancer relapse to motivate the ideas and what the, some of the underlying themes and just to introduce some of the basic concepts. And here I'll be able to talk about not just subcellular localization of proteins, which is just sort of part of the domain, but more importantly, some of the contrast between correlation and prediction and univariate versus multivariate. That'll be the foundation, the motivating example. I'll then step back and talk about machine learning 101. 
what machine learning can do in a, at a high level. Some of the algorithms and some of the challenges, like how do you evaluate these tools. As time permits, I'll talk about other learning tasks in the medical application areas and then other topics. And that'll be the talk. And at some point, I, I guess Kim will say slow down or stop, and I'll, or go faster and stop. But, uh, but at some point, I'll find out. Uh, OK, good. Um, so introduction, uh, some sad statistics that uh, in the US and Canada as well, about one in eight women will get breast cancer. Uh, it's the second most common cancer amongst, amongst women in the developed world. And there's lots of treatment people have applied, surgery, chemotherapy, and so forth. Does anyone know the statistics of what percentage will actually have a relapse despite all these aggressive approaches? Okay, well, the answer, uh, something like 30 percent. In spite of the fact it's a very common disease and people care about it, and people are trying to treat it, this is a 30 percent relapse rate. No one knows why. Why some will have relapses, but others won't. Are there ways we can try to help out the basic scientists to give them some insights for what's happening? What leads to the relapse, and what can we do to perhaps prevent that? So one important notion that leads to some of the problems with cancers in general is something called metastasis. Tumor cells that start in one location go into other areas. And that, again, is associated with the relapses in the original site as well as with death from cancer. For breast cancer, the survival rates are widely split between whether relapse happened or not. 98% of the women for whom the breast cancer was localized, it didn't spread, survived five years, whereas only one in four will survive by those distant metastases. So clearly, if you understood what leads to these metastasizing processes, that would give a good indication of who will have a relapse. So as a way to try to predict the relapse or survival time, it's helpful to know which ta tumors will metastasize, which ones will actually spread out elsewhere, what corresponds to these factors. So now I'm going to do the one slide on biology. I'm not a biologist, so I apologize in advance to people who know better what's going on. But this is my, um, a lay person's understanding or misunderstanding of part of the relevant process here. There's something called cell adhesion, that there's a bunch of proteins that sit on the outside of cell walls that zip the cell lines together, the whole tissues together. And it goes by this complicated name of cathedron catenin complexes. Again, proteins that live in the cell walls and try to hold the cells together in a tissue, to form a tissue. That's what they're supposed to do. Some of these complexes, these kind of proteins, some of these proteins go rogue. Instead of doing their job holding the cells together, they end up moving around inside the cell. They move to the cytoplasm. They move to the nucleus of the cell. And then not just are they not holding the cell together, that is, the cells are now freer to move. But also, there seems evidence that suggests that they're involved with some of the growth, some of the processes. They might be oncogenes. They might trigger a transformation of a cell to becoming cancerous, to lead to, to travel and to metastasize. So that's this underlying understanding. Does that make sense to the medical people here? That's a crude understanding of what's going on. So <clears throat> that's my understanding of it, at least. So the situation was this. My colleague said, we can tell you about a bunch of patients. For each patient, we can tell you <coughs> excuse me, the location of these junctional proteins, where they're located. Are they doing their job on the outside of the cell wall, or are they going rogue, and are they being naughty and playing games elsewhere and perhaps causing problems? This is observed prior to treatment, so the time the woman enters this treatment procedure. Can we use that and predict, given the information, which patients will have a relapse or not. So that's a challenge. And if we could solve that, we could help physicians. If you knew that some cells are rogue and that's problematic, maybe that suggests a treatment that would be effective. It might also help researchers. If you know something about the underlying mechanism within the cell of what's going on, maybe that can help identify markers or pathways for treatments, or maybe new drugs or predictive factors. So it can be very helpful if we could do this. All core science questions, core biology questions, core oncology questions. But I'm looking from a machine learning point of view. So they said to help me as a non-biologist, a non-oncologist, uh, to help me help them, they said, here's some data. We've got patients. We've got 66 women who were historical. They were, they were examined, I guess that's 15 years ago, 15 to 11 years ago. 
And some had recurrence and some did not. Some had relapse, some did not. And for each woman, we measured a bunch of features. The age and tumor side. This word axillary is not a typo. That refers to a certain type of, of, of node. The stage, grade, and other factors about each individual woman. We also know the concentration of the four of these growth regulatory proteins, things which are considered relevant and possibly suspect. These are sort of celebrity genes that, that have made the news on lots of, lots of fora to, as being associated with certain types of cancer for various reasons. And most important of the study, there also are these other factors. We know there are six junctional proteins for each of those, and these are names like alpha-catenin, beta-catenin, e cadherin Again, things which are just symbols to me, but the biologists, they all say, oh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's my friend, Mr. Beta-catenin. Tell me about him. They know these proteins, and for every protein, we know where they're, where they're doing their work. Are they doing their job in the cell membrane where they should be? Or have they started to wander about? Are they in bad locations? OK, so here's my data set. I've got 66 patients. I know 30 features of each patient. These cathedron mediated adhesion complexes, these, if each of these guys, oh, can I do this? Um, I, I can say where, you know, for alpha catenin, where it's located, membrane, cytoplasm, nucleus, and so forth, as well as other clinical pathohistological, is that the right word? The, these other factors. And I also know that the outcome, how many survived, how many had early relapse, how many did not. So now what do you do with it? So I've got the data, I've got the challenge, what's the next step? One game that's often played, a very important game, is finding correlations. The, the biologists, the basic oncologists, the, 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 the people doing the basic science will say, tell me, for example, what protein I should knock out or what I should amplify. Tell me how I can begin to understand this phenomenon better. And that's great. They look at these tables and they figure out <coughs> Uh, what the correlation is, what the, what the uh, p-value of a t-test is, or in this case just correlation, that says how is this feature correlated with the outcome? And they can say which feature is most relevant. That says what to probe next. And so again, this made up numbers here, uh, certain factors might be considered very important. And now that they will knock these out or amplify them. Again, it's basic science, that's how they work. Very important task. A lot of biostatisticians do that. And that's important to find out what's going on, but that's not my mission. They asked me not to say what features are important, but what patients will happen next. Can we find what happens for a novel instance? A new patient comes in, what happens to her? So part of this, this caricature, I would say that biostatistics is most looking correlation. I'm looking more at finding predictors. So for example, instead of what gene should I, what should I knock out, but Ask, answering a question, patient's question, how much longer will it spread? How much longer do you have to live? And this is going to metastasize. So that's a question I was asked to agree with, to deal with, and that's part of the challenge here. And getting an answer back, hopefully the answer here that says it's not going to spread. A good, good response. So how would you build a classifier? I can look at the historical patients and find, for example, number of lymph nodes that's known to be associated. And here we could draw a line saying, if there's any lymph nodes, predict recurrence, if there's no lymph nodes, predict no. So that'd be one way to do it. Of course, that's only one of 30 features. I can look at the concentration of beta catenin in the nucleus and find a predictor based on that, which has a very low correlation score, as this plot suggests. Or maybe look at the tumor size. Maybe there's some indications there that could be informative. Or maybe look at the age of diagnosis or, or this P10, one of these celebrity proteins, and try to find ways to make decisions based on one feature. Well, which one is he should use? Well, uh, the obvious answer is use the one that works best. Good, how do I do that? Well, I could measure the quality. Um, I could look at how it worked in the past, but you've all seen these ads on TV that say, you know, here's a stock that goes up, but past performance is not necessarily indicative of future performance. You've heard these ads, right? Same thing here, right? The fact that it did well on the training sample doesn't necessarily mean it's going to do as well or do the same on the, perform on the future, on the patients I care about. <clears throat> but the more, comp the more relevant point is, who said use one feature? Why am I looking at a single factor? Maybe there's multiple factors that co by combination can do a good job. So again, if I go back to my caricature of 
biostatistics versus machine learning. One issue is correlation versus prediction. The other issue is univariate, find a single protein or single feature which is relevant, and can contrast that with multivariate. Find combinations of proteins that predict, or combination of features that predict the best outcome. So I want to think about that quest. How do you find a combination? So what I want is here's a novel patient, and there's a description of, of things about this woman. Here's this 30 tuple that describes all the features that we mentioned earlier. A classifier is a tool that, given this 30 tuple, comes back and says, here's my prediction. Is this going to be a recurrence? And the answer, hopefully, the answer is no. So in the future, maybe medical science will know how to look at the position of e-cathedron and the patient's age and how many lymph nodes and, and use some other complicated reasoning and understand the, by the underlying physics of the disease, be able to say, at this point, I know for sure that there will be a relapse or there will not be. That would be great. If that happens, you don't need me. You just ask the biologist. Unfortunately, we're not there now. We do, however, have historical patients, this, this patient I mentioned earlier. Are there ways to use these patients, this combination of characteristics for a large body of historical data, and run it through an automated tool, this learning algorithm, and it'll come back and it will say, it will produce a classifier, which I can then use for future patients. So that's the quest. Can I build a learning algorithm that takes the data and returns this complicated thing, this rule that says how to predict who will have a breast cancer, who will have a relapse, and who will not? Are people tracking so far? Any questions? So let me go on. Uh, so the question now is, how do you do this? How do you find the patterns? Um, I was a little late today because I teach a class in machine learning that happened just right before this class over in CAB. Um, so there's a whole semester-long class that just skirts along, you know, uh, along the tip of some of these issues. But they describe how to use these, these tools and tricks. I'll talk about some machine learning tools right now, how to find these patterns in the data. So let me make a simple example. Imagine this was a data. I look at just number of lymph nodes and age of diagnosis. I admit this made up data, of course. And the pluses means, unfortunately, there was a relapse. And the minus means no relapse in five years. So if I have this data, and now I have a new patient, this patient in blue, um, any thoughts? Is this, is, is this a positive or a negative example? Positive? OK. I think most people would agree. And that's, that's probably my guess as well, that it sort of feels like it's positive. It's in, the, it's in the neighborhood of other positives. It's sort of localized with other positive examples. And that's the intuition, that you can probably find certain patterns in data. Like here's a very simple one, just number of lymph nodes was indicative. And that's much simpler than the reality, but that illustrates a basic idea. Of course, this is an educated guess. This is just a guess, but maybe you can do reliably. Again, physicians do the same thing. They try to make predictions about patients. And Hopefully, they're right a lot. Same with this tool. Hopefully, it's correct here. So this was a very easy problem with just two dimensions, and it's a well-separated class, positives here, negatives there. Should I move, not move so much? I, don't know. I, I just hate standing still. Uh, but imagine it did look like this. So now there's uh, multiple places of positives and negatives. And, and this example is right in the middle. And you could, you could have arguments both ways for why it's positive or negative. Of course, it's two dimensions. What if it's three dimensions, where you have multiple things? I deal with microarray data, which is not three or four dimensions, but it's 50,000 dimensional data. How do you graph that? And if you understand how to do that, I look at SNP data. I'll talk about that in a moment. Where it's not 50,000, it's 500,000 dimensional. And now there's million or even three million features per patient. Now what do you do? You can't visualize and see it here. Are there tricks you can use that go beyond just a visualization that can actually find the patterns automatically? So that's, I'll talk about how to do that. I'll talk about some simple algorithms just to say it's possible. And then go back to this example. So linear separators, linear line separators, separation, right? So this is a straight line separating the data. So here could be an example of a linear separator that just says more than one and a half lymph nodes, yes, otherwise no. And that would be a very simple classifier. That's too simple to even call a classifier. Perhaps it's just such a, it's just a single feature. It can be more complicated. Um, you could have a slope. You could have, again, in two dimensions, it'd be two, three parameters. Let's say 
as a combination of the age and the number of lymph nodes, here's a way to make a diagnosis for this data. Um, in, so once I have these, these features, I can then easily do a prediction. For a given woman, I measure her age, I measure her lymph nodes, and I do this combination, and I say yes or no, depending on whether that number is greater than zero or not. Um, so I just have the learning task is just finding these numbers, these parameters. So in general, I have a bunch of features, <clears throat> and we're trying to find the weights, so it's such a linear combination. So a straight line is a linear combination of features. So I want to find just the linear combinations that say, basically, if this feature multiply it by some number, then the second thing, multiply it by a number, positive or negative, and keep adding them up. If that's bigger than zero, then say yes, although I say no. People tracking? I haven't said I do it yet, but, but there's some good news. So this, uh, this is what I said a moment ago. Right? So, so given the weights, you get a bunch of those are the weights you come up with. Given the features, you now add them up, take linear combinations. If that's, you then have a number that's bigger than zero, you say yes. So the challenge, of course, is finding those weights. Okay. So support vector machines um, are a tool you might have heard about. Imagine this is a data with some positive and some negative data. If I want a line that fits the data, there's one line I could, I could draw. And here's another one. Here's another one. And here's another one. A whole bunch of lines, all of which do perfectly on the data. Which one do you think? Which one would you prefer using? How many people think Mr. Purple is a good answer? Orange? All of them? No. No, you got to pick one. You got to... So who thinks, so any, any other guesses? Who, any votes here? It's a democracy. We can, uh... Green. Green. OK. Ah, I thought so too. Why is green a good answer? Sort of looks like it's a compromise. You know, if all those lines got together and hammered it out, green would, would be the compromise. That's a good way to think about it. One other way to think about it, and you got, you got it just right, is it's robust. If I, <clears throat> yeah, imagine this point was a little bit off. Now, Mr. Purple would get it wrong. Or at this point, was a little bit off. Mr. Brown would get it wrong. Green is robust. He's far away from all the different dividing points. So that's, what, that's what's so nice. He's, the, the distance of him to any other points is as large as possible. And that's something called the margin. It's a distance between a line and the nearest point. And you try to maximize that minimum distance. And support vector machines do that and do it very efficiently. So, so that's the good news, that there are ways to find it. And you can show it actually works very well. So if you look in the literature, if you just scan the papers, occasionally you see mention of these support vector machines. Well, that's what it is. It's trying to find linear separators which maximize the distance. So let me tell you some good news. The good news is if the data you have is linearly separable, if there is, in fact, a way to put positives here and negatives there, and remember, this might be 537 dimensional data, so you can't visualize it, but there can still be a line that separates it. If that's true, there's very fast algorithms that will find a correct one, and in fact, will find the best one. So that's good news. If linearly separable, if linearly separable, then you can solve it. Now, the bad news is here's a challenge for people in the audience find me a line that, that involves these four points that puts all the pluses on one side, all the minuses on the other side. Okay, any guesses? So this line doesn't work because it's got plus on one side. The other side's got some minuses, but there's still a plus there. But maybe I can rotate it. You know, I can try different things. Mm. Can, there's no way to do it by rotating. Oh, but maybe I can move it. Right, I can move it. Is there any way I can put all the pluses on one side and all the minuses on the other side? Anyone see a way to do it? Mm. You can't. There's no, this data is not, this simple example with four points is not linearly separable. Folded in half, if, if you cheat, you can do it, yeah. But the way the data is done right now, that's the, that's the way the good Lord handed the data to you, and you can't do anything about it. But there are tricks like what you said that actually do work, but we'll get later on. So some data sets are not linearly separable. 
Now, there are extensive linear separators using things called kernels and things which do kind of like fold in half, which is an interesting insight you came up with that. But another body of tools are decision trees. A decision tree is a really obvious idea. There are at least five different disciplines which have invented decision trees. You know, machine learning and statistics and operations research and various other areas have all found the same idea. It's really obvious. Take your data, find some way to split it into a half. And the halves may not be pure, but they're going to have different qualities. Now I split it again. And I keep doing this until I get purity, until one, the remaining block just as pluses or just as minuses, and I stop. So that's the idea of a decision tree that I haven't said how to do it, but, but you can imagine doing this, and you have these partition tools. It's a recursive partition algorithms in the medical community. It's another name for this. So you can imagine a tree that's formed that says for a new patient, first ask, is this patient, is the temperature more than 35? And if, if no, then ask about the blood pressure and make decisions. If yes, then ask about a different quality about the blood pressure and so forth. So eventually you get some pure thing. There's just two dimensions. You can imagine having different features and ask about age and gender and height and so forth. But that's a decision tree. Now, how do you learn it? How do you split? How do you stop? Great questions. Take my machine learning class. We'll talk about it there. Or, or go. There's a website of something that we developed here, the Exploratorium, that, that guides you through some simple examples of it. For now, <clears throat> let me just say that we actually found a decision tree that worked for the. Remember the problem I motivated about alpha cathedrons and these things that I couldn't quite pronounce about cells sitting together. So here was a decision tree that was learned. And this tree, you know, it basically says. If, the constant, if there's any alpha catenin in the nucleus, if there's any is greater than zero, then it's probably going to be relapse. Okay, that makes sense. If not, if there's no alpha catenin, if there's no alpha catenin, now ask the number of lymph nodes. And again, that's another good marker. Any lymph nodes that predict relapse, and go on and say if there's no, if there's no lymph nodes, ask about P10. And here's a very interesting one that if there's no P10 predict relapse. If there's a lot of pretend, predict no relapse. Otherwise, ask about beta catenin. And I get this tree. So the medical people look at it and sort of nod their heads. They don't quite understand the last thing, but they're willing to believe it, willing to believe it's sort of plausible. It has the right type of characteristics, which is good. OK, so <clears throat> there are other tricks. I mentioned kernels. I mentioned the neural nets, Bayesian classifiers, K nearest neighbors. There are ways to combine different classifiers. There's ways to do boosting and bagging, and all sorts of clever stuff. Again, <clears throat> a semester-long class just sort of skims along the surface of the topics. <clears throat> um, but it's an exciting area with lots of tools. So now I said, there you go. There's a decision tree. Trust me. Well, you shouldn't be quite so trusting. If I have a decision tree, what do you do with it? How do you confirm it does work? So let me understand this by backing up and saying, what is the goal? Why are we learning at all? What are we trying to do? And the answer is a little bit subtle. I have a training sample I showed you in the upper right corner. <clears throat> so if, if the goal of learning was just to do well on the training data, you don't need any learning for that. I already got it. A was no, B was yes, and D was no. I'm done. That's not the goal. The goal instead is to handle new patients. So I set up my clinic, and I have 100 women come in with breast cancer. I look at those, and I see what happens. But now I don't care about, about these individuals from my studies. I care about the next woman who comes in, the next individual who needs treatment or needs to be dealt with. So I want to have unseen data. I want to do well on patients I haven't seen the training data and do well on that. So that's my goal. It means I have to guess effectively. It's guessing. It's, it's making predictions about things I don't know the answer to. How can it possibly succeed? Let me give you an answer. This is my why machine learning should work while standing on one foot. Right? Oh, it's about pacing. Right? So here's the game. There's a real world. And there's a bunch of patients drawn from that. There's some, some distribution. There's women in Edmonton who are curious, who want to know about what happens to the breast cancer they unfortunately have. That's my data sample. I take that data sample, I throw it into a learner, and it produces a classifier. And by construction, the classifier I come up with, the thing that, that's produced from this, is designed to do a good job 
on the data it was trained on, on that data sample D. Okay, that's, that's sort of the basic idea of what goes on. Now, I have a new patient with the same distribution. You know, I have a clinic in Edmonton and it has a certain population of women, and now another woman comes in from the same ethnicity, the same culture, the same diet, the same sort of factors. And I want to, I want to treat this woman. I wonder what happens to her. So let me look at two cases. So one case is, suppose this woman is someone I've seen before. I've seen her twin sister. I've seen someone who looks very, very similar to her. Well, if, I, if my data set has seen, includes a woman like this, that means that my learner has seen someone similar to this individual. And remember, the learner is designed to do a good job on patients it's seen. So it's probably going to get this woman right. That's the good news. So for common patients, if I have a big enough data sample, I've probably seen the common cases. If I have you know, um, a data sample of size, if, if a certain class of women occurs one time in 10, and I've seen 10 examples, I probably, I might have seen her. If I've seen 50 examples, I can guarantee you I've seen a one in 10 event. I've probably seen several copies of it. So for common cases, I've seen that type. I probably do a good job. Well, not everyone's common. Not everyone has the same case. I mean, for example, um, <clears throat> the, about one in eight women have breast cancer. About one in a thousand men develop breast cancer. It does happen. Um, if I have a sample size 100, I probably haven't seen these rare cases of men with cancer. Uh, I took a slightly different statistics, but for rare cases, I might not have seen that individual. And that means I probably, I might, I probably will get them wrong. Well, if you had to decide between getting a one in three wrong or a one in a thousand wrong, I'd rather get the one in a thousand wrong. I'd rather not, get, not, I'd rather not make any mistakes, but I have to make a mistake, let's get the common cases right. And that's exactly what machine learning does. You get, you get a big enough data sample, it probably has a common cases. You train on that, you probably can do a good job with those common cases. Now, you're going to get other ones wrong. Learning algorithms aren't perfect. Physicians aren't perfect either, right? It'd be nice if, if they could do their job correctly, but medical science is not to the point where they know what's going on enough to get the right answers. So we're hoping that we can do a good enough job on the common cases, a common being based on the size of the data sample. So that's the idea. So this is the machine learning, why can't it work? You take a big enough sample that you've probably seen the most, the most common cases, and now we're going to do well in those common cases, and therefore you probably will get the common cases in the future right. And the ones that, in the future, that are rare, well, if they were common, in the future they probably were common when you first saw them. Questions about this? This is a critical point. This is sort of what, what, what goes on to machine learning. Let me go on. So with that in mind, I hand you, I built a classifier. It happens to be a decision tree. How well does it work? How do you evaluate it? So here's an example where I've got a bunch of patients. I take all the data and I built a tool for measuring recurrence. And now one I, intuition is, let's take the same data and test it and see what it does on the data we trained on. It's a bad idea. Why is that a bad idea? Well, imagine I'm teaching a class in machine learning and there's a final. The, the final exam is this Friday. And, and so on Wednesday, on Tuesday, I say, here's a copy of the final exam. Why don't you guys look at it, study it. Good, you got it? Give it back to me. On Friday, I say, okay, here you go. Here's the same test. What's going to happen? I'm, you're probably going to get a very good score in it. Is that because you understand the material? Well, maybe you do, but it's a very optimistic measure. It's because I'm, you're literally you're testing on the training data. The data you learned to learn the material is part of what you had to try to evaluate it. I shouldn't do that. Instead of doing that, I should say, I should instead say, here's data you trained on and have a different set to test on. That's like saying to training, here's Lasher's exam. Here's Dale Schumann's exam. Here's Rich Sutton's exam. Train on that. Understand that. Because it's similar enough. It's from the same distribution, but not identical. Same distribution, so hopefully you get the insights of what's going on. So that's what this is showing. You train on some set, subset, and test on the other one. So there's a slight refinement of this idea. It's called a holdout set. You can be a little clever about it. 
And let me use this picture to show what's going on. I've got a data sample. I call it labeled because I know the outcome for these historical patients. I'm going to first <coughs> run this learner and find a classifier. I have a decision tree I call it beta here. So I do some work. I come up with that. And now the next question is, how good is that? So to answer that question, I'm going to play this funny game called cross-validation. I'm going to take the data, take four-fifths of it and train that, and put the other fifth behind my back. I'm going to take that four-fifths of data and train a classifier in that. And after I've done training it, I evaluate it on data that it wasn't trained on. So I take four-fifths of data, train on that, produce a new classifier, and then evaluate that on the data it wasn't trained on. So I can do that and get an estimate. I can say, well, that's one-fifth. I can keep going. I can take another fifth of data, put it behind my back, train another four-fifths of data, come up with other classifiers, and do this. I can do this five different times. I get five different classifiers, five different scores. And the only reason I'm doing this is to get these five numbers, because the average of that is an estimate of how good I would do, how good this classifier I come up with will do. More precisely, it's how good this learning algorithm does in that data set. Okay, so this is called cross-validation. It's a way to say how good I will do on new data, because I'm using the same game on the same type of data and extrapolating to say it's going to do a good job. Is that clear? OK. Um, so <clears throat> back to the example where so there is a difference. Here's, a, here's when we looked at those three different individual classifiers trained on, on uh, the data. So the blue line shows how well, we, how well the classifier does on the data it's trained on. And you can see it's, it does very good. The, the dotted lines, the dotted points, are actually how good it does on this five-fold cross-validation. And you can see there's a gap, that some things look really good but are doing much less effective. Okay. The difference between the resubstitution error and the true error, between the data you get if you cheat versus the real, realistic data. So back to the game, um, I'm looking at different classifiers, uh, single feature classifier, what's the best one, SVMs, decision trees, and so forth. And it turns out decision tree did about 80% accurate. And that was on this, by this mechanism of having holdout data. So what were the results? Just to wrap up here, there are eight standard features. There's a tool called Adjuvant Exclamation Point that's online that uses eight features to try to predict um, um, relapse for women. We can train on that, we get about 60%, 66% accuracy. If you throw in the total concentrations of these, of these junctional proteins, it goes a little bit better. If not just the total concentration, but you do the localized concentrations, you actually say, you actually say not just that it was this much in the cell, but here's where it's localized, it goes a little bit better yet from 66 to 71. And that is statistically better than the first result. If you also throw in these other factors, P53 and so forth, in the learning tool, it goes up to the 79% that I mentioned earlier. So about 80% accuracy based on a classified based on these features. Again, that was published a few years ago. Okay. Um, so this was an example. Have people seen this slide before? I think it's almost mandatory to include the slide in every bioinformatics talk. It's something that, uh, uh, that was produced by, um, by the Energy Commission, by the Energy Commission US, who were talking about DNA. So question, why would the Energy Commission care about doing this? They build power plants, and anyway, you'll have to think about it. So it's a great slide um, that tries to understand what's going on. Um, so here we're talking about how proteins and subcell localization can help. Now I'm at the accordion part of my talk, right? Um, I can talk about other applications, and I could spend an hour each one of these, or if, if I'm told to wrap up, I can go faster and faster. Okay. Well, the usual plan would be to finish the formal lecture at 3, and to entertain questions for uh, 20 minutes. Now, it depends upon what you feel about how tough these guys are. If you think that the questions are going to be really stressful, then you might want to go to 310. Okay, <laughs> but anyway, it's, it's, it's sort, of, uh, well, sort of up to you. But the, we, we, we finish at uh, 3. 
uh, 20. Well, yeah. let me go the other way, uh, show of hands. I could sort of wrap up here, or I could keep going and talk about applications. So wrap up here, other application areas. Okay, so, okay. and silence. Okay. Who's there? okay, so let me go on. At some point, I'll talk really fast, fast, fast. You get done, but no. I'll just, so here are some other applications, things I've worked on to try to show some of the ideas. Um, so metabolomics, who's heard that phrase before? Okay. So uh, you're lucky to be in Alberta. We're one of the hotbeds in the whole field of metabolomics. This is really understanding uh, the small molecules in our body and using those to do diagnosis. It's a, like genomics and proteomics, but looking at factors which can be very sensitive to current, dis current disease state. So the human metabolome project started by my colleague Dave Wishart tries to understand the metabolome, the metabolites in, in, in a human body, and find associations and treatments based on that. So we had a task, there's something called cachexia. These are patients wasting away. If you've seen victims of the Holocaust, you know, people, these emaciated bodies, emaciated within of food, you see similar body profiles of people who are, have cancer or AIDS. It's not that they're not being fed, they just can't metabolize it, they can't deal with it. Can we determine who has this disease, who has cachexia? So the game here is, is actually a different women, by the way. Uh, take a urine sample, run it through an NMR spectrum, uh, automatically find this profile, find a metabolic profile, and then classify this to say who's going to waste away, who's going to lose muscle mass in the next 100 days. So we have a task for doing that. Machine learning can help find these pro mapping profiles to disease state for cachexia. And we did this for a bunch of patients, 82% accuracy. Had a paper on that, I guess, three years ago. Um, colon cancer. Um, colonoscopies is a definitive test for this pre-cancer, pre-colon cancer. It's expensive and uncomfortable. Is there a screen for who should take it? Now, who here is over 50? Well, who here knows what that thing in the upper right-hand corner is? Uh, be glad you don't, right? It's a, it's a way to, it's something called a, a Fecal occult blood test. If you know what that means, I'm sorry. Uh, but, uh, but it's a test that's used to try to determine um, is there blood that, that means you should now be scoped, have this, have this colonoscopy. Um, <clears throat> so there's a test for doing it based on this icky thing that has high non compliance because people don't like to do it. Instead of that, we want to say, come to my lab, pee in a cup, and we'll put it into the, mag into the magnet and give you an answer. And it turns out, we did studies, and this thing strictly dominates. You can do much better over a wide range of application areas. It's a better tool to have this urine-based test. And it's a collaboration with a local company, and we had a paper that just came out this month on this. So, so that was metabolomics. Talk about, about transcriptomics. So microarrays. Who knows what a, micro, what a, what a DNA microarray is? OK, good. Well, let me, for the rest of us, um, so here's this interesting thing I was confused by at first. So, so there's a body, no one I know, I hope, and it's got eyes and lungs and hearts and skin, all very different types of cells. But of course, there's one blueprint for all these cells, the DNA. Right? That's like saying I've got one blueprint, and that blueprint, I can build this laptop, I can build that light, I can build that door with it. How can one blueprint build laptops and lights and doors and the answer is pretty obvious. Different parts of the blueprint are doing different things. Within the whole blueprint, this part of it is designing laptops, and this part's for lights, and so forth. Same is true here. Within the DNA, different portions of it, different genes are being read that produce an eye cell, or a lung cell, or a liver cell. That's the basic idea. Um, a microarray, a DNA microarray, measures what part of the DNA, which genes are being read for this particular cell. And that makes it easy to distinguish lung from heart from skin and so forth. Of course, any pathologist could do it without DNA. They just look at it. What's more interesting is tumors are based on other parts of DNA, and maybe different concentrations are being used. And different tumors might involve different regions, different parts of DNA. Can we look at the DNA? at the microarray to figure out what part's being read and use that for interesting tasks, such as determining um, which tumors are going to metastasize, uh, how to treat certain tumors. So that's what a microarray is. Now, breast cancer, 
It's really many different diseases, at least three well-defined. Some recent papers are saying it's 10 diseases. In fact, it's actually many more than that. But just looking at the major distinction, the treatment for breast cancer depends on which sub-disease you have. And one indicator is this hormone receptor status. So it's known that if, some, if a woman is ER positive, you give it tamoxifen, give her tamoxifen. It seems to work effectively. If, other, if it's not, then maybe if it's HER2, you give it trituzumab. So it makes a difference. What, it makes a difference for a given woman what type of cancer she has, what treatment she should get. And now if you look back in 2008, there was a bunch of news about this testing scandal that, that pathologists do a great job in general, but the summary was 37% of the patients in St. John were misdiagnosed. They got the ER positive status wrong. In Quebec, they did a study and they found 15 to 20% got certain parts wrong. Um, patients died, right? they got the wrong treatment. Are there ways we could help with this quest? So can we do the same machine learning thing for microarrays? do a biopsy, do a DNA scan, um, find information from that, build a classifier, and produce ER positive or negative. So machine learning can help, same thing. You look at historical patients. We had 160 patients. We had 33,000 different values per patient. Can we use that to build a classifier? OK, uh, lots of challenges. So one challenge for me as a machine learning person is machine learning knows a lot about you know, thousands of examples with 30 features each. What we don't know is how to go the other way, how to handle high-dimensional data with very many of them. There are tricks to use, and we explore lots of different tricks, some that didn't use biology, some that did. Um, net effect, we built a tool which had like, instead of the 15 or 20 or 30 percent, we had like 5 percent error. There's a paper under review right now that should be accepted any day now to try to, this shows we can do much better for this. SNPs, I think I'm going to go a bit faster. Things look at single nucleotide polymorphisms. Uh, we did some papers on that, yada, yada, yada. Um, lots of different things that we can handle, all with the same basic technology. Uh, brain tumors, so I do work with MRI scans of, of tumors. And I'm going to skip this as well, just saying that there's, there's challenges of how to do segmentation, how to find the tumor and predict what's going to happen next. Um, skipping, skipping, skipping. Um, pretty pictures of where the tumor is located and what will happen next. How do they grow? Beautiful pictures. I wish you guys could see this. Diffusion tensor imaging, that sort of shows where the bundles are. The tumors actually flow along those. Uh, I wasn't involved, but one of my friends had a paper on Riemannian manifolds to predict how these things would grow. Great stuff. fMRI is another challenge. So instead of looking at a single feature per patient, we're looking at, at um, <coughs> at sort of a time series of how much blood, ox how much oxygen is in the blood at certain locations. Let me back up. Um, psychiatric disorders may present very similarly, but may have very different treatments. So depression, patients who are always with a, a down mood, look the same as bipolar, who go from down to up and back and forth. But different treatments, right? A depressed patient, you want to give a mood elevator, whereas a manic depressive patient, you want to give a mood stabilizer. But how do you tell the difference? How can you find what treatment was most effective if all you see is one factor? Can we look at fMRI studies that look at different parts of the brain and measure qualities of that to do better treatments? Um, we've got some data. We're playing with that. We actually had an interesting study. We looked at ADHD. There was a worldwide competition uh, that tried to predict ADHD, uh, um, attention deficit disorder, and hyperactivity disorder. And we did the best, kind of. Ask me later, I'll tell you what, what happened there. We're looking at diabetes management using reinforcement learning. Um, uh, let me talk about another thing. So let me sort of give a final example of sort of foundational work. Oh, I should stay here, sorry. <clears throat> Do people know what a Kaplan-Meier plot is? So this is a curve that says, of the, of the patients who have stage four stomach cancer, everyone's alive at time of diagnosis, but after, um, after 11 months, half of them have passed away. So it's a curve that says how many people are alive as a function of how many months since the treatment they are, uh, how many months after the diagnosis. And you can get facts like this. You can get error bars. You can say that 90% you know, uh, live at least two months. Only 10% live longer than 51 months. So you can say I'm 80% confident that a patient with stage four stomach cancer will live between two and 51 months. Okay, so you could do statistics like that. That's a Kaplan-Meier. It's a survival curve. 
That's based only on the cancer location, uh, stomach, and stage, stage four. Can we do better than that? Can we build a more astute predictor that's going to help patients? So here are two patients, both with stage four stomach cancer. Um, in general, all we could say is the mean is 11 months, and it's between this, this wide gap. But it turns out we know more than just stage and type. We know uh, other blood factors to these patients. And it turns out, for the first patient, we can actually predict this patient is not, the mean is about times not 11 months, but from like 21 months. It's twice as long. And for this other patient, unfortunately, it's only, instead of 11 months, it's only a fifth that. There's a factor of 10 difference between patients, and we can predict that. And we can build these survival curves for individual patients and use that more effectively. They're just saying, here's a curve for everybody. So again, it's patient specific. OK, I'm going to skip, 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 skip. Don't look. We talk about some statistical issues, and then we'll wrap up. Actually, um, or should I wrap up now? Uh, well, I'm just not sure whether I can do justice. Uh, should we, maybe I'll, I'll wrap up here. There's interesting questions about covariate shift about populations. Ask me later on. Take my machine learning class. I'll talk in great detail about these things. But let me just maybe, um, maybe go to the end. Uh, there's learning as a way to predict Relapse, no relapse, or time to relapse. You can learn models. You can try to learn factors about how things are related. Um, there's ways to learn to control. And again, the talks on reinforcement learning is very much on controlling. How would you learn how to control the IBO? How, would you, how to control to drive a car? All in the context of learning. Oh, I'll skip that. Just we found we recovered some of the structure by looking at some data. I'm going to skip that as well. Um, let me skip this also. Just saying that there's a lot of ways to make machine learning that I need, as machine learning is kind of a service in the sense that we're trying to do a good job for someone else's problem. I need collaborators, and it's nice to think of what I need for the learning to succeed, what I expect for my collaborators to have. And again, lots of tools here on the slides that are available later on. There are tools, do people know what this is? This bird? It's a weka. It's a New Zealand bird that gave its name to this very easy to use tool that's common. And the guy who did it um, was at Calgary, but he wanted to be close to an ocean. Calgary wasn't close to an ocean, so he left us and went to New Zealand, which, which is where this bird is native, and built this great tool. Uh, challenges and what I'm doing, let me skip, skip. I work with lots of collaborators. I have to acknowledge that they're wonderful. They're clever people doing exciting things. Um, and maybe let me summarize. So I started by saying, there's this great area called association studies, which is really important. It's great for deciding what tests to run next. Great stuff. But it's not designed for patient-specific treatment. It's not designed for helping tell Mr. Smith or Mr. Jones what we should do next. Machine learning has predictive studies, ways to produce these classifiers or regressors or these distributions that are very helpful for predicting patient-specific treatments. I won't say useful. I'll say it's absolutely essential. It's necessary for that. Machine learning has tools for producing such predictors, and it's, so it's, hence it's critical for many applications like bioinformatics and medical informatics. I'll stop there and take questions or comments. <laughs> OK, so. Uh, Can I walk around now? Oh. No. <laughs> OK. Um, I, I don't know if I completely understand all the math behind it. I've only taken an introductory statistics course, and that was a few years ago. Um, but I just wanted to clarify. So basically, you have um, some kind of an algorithm. You've got machine. You, you have a bunch of data, and you have a machine, and you input. You have some kind of algorithm, and it's going to extract patterns from that data and use that data to make a predictor when you give it uh, a you different, don't. OK. That's perfect, um, yeah. so, and so there's issues. So if the, so if the, um, the novel setting, the novel patient, uh, is different from that data set, it's going to be a lot harder, you said, to, yes. to make these predictions? OK, so um, there's several reasons why it's difficult. So one of this underlying assumption that you train on some data, and you're testing on the same type of data. So I train in Edmonton. I want to be tested in Edmonton patients. Is it going to work for Calgary? Probably. Is it going to work for Biafra? Maybe. But it depends. So the slides I skipped were talking about this idea of making sure the testing data matches the training data. 
Okay. Um, I'm not saying it won't work, but the guarantees are off at that point. Okay. So then, uh, I don't know, we were talking in some of the other, um, the past lectures about, I guess, machine learning that's going to be accumulating and sort of making, I guess, like online changes to the way it's, it's working with this data. So could that be a way to overcome something like that where uh, it's like... Great point. That's excellent. Yes, sir. The model I've been presenting is batch learning. Yeah. Training data, done with training, now we, now, now we test on new things. There's online learning, which is used in a lot of applications where you, 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 you have a moving window. You constantly have the data you've looked at. And the distribution shifts. Oh, I shouldn't move, sorry. The distribution shifts, you sort of track it. Um, Yahoo. Um, if you go to the Yahoo main page, the front page of Yahoo, the, it tries to figure out, based on your IP address and maybe if you've logged on, what page to go to. So if it, if it, if it shows you an article at the top and you click on it and you then go to uh, an ad on that page, Yahoo makes money. That's how they make money. Uh, can they, can they, can they um, direct the traffic that way? They've got 200 million hits a day. They're trying to track what's trending, what's hot, what's going on. And they have, a bat, they have an online algorithm that tries to adjust it dynamically over time, oh, okay. as an example. But again, there are also online tools from many other places. It's often, often it requires, re, you know, most of the classifiers are very fast. But the learning can be slower. You don't mind spending a CPU week to get a solved cancer, right? Mm. But if a woman comes in and needs treatment right now, you don't want to wait a week. I mean, how much faster? So there are trade-offs here. Okay. But great point. Online sure. learning is a very important topic. And uh, I had one more question, and that's I noticed that all the graphs you were showing it looked like with machine learning, there's a lot better diagnostic, there's better predictive ability, there's a, it, than just regular doctors. Is that what? Uh, uh, I, some didn't, of I didn't say do better than doctors. I, okay. I never said that. My uh, but but but. I mean, well, maybe not better than doctors. Sorry, I don't want to say I don't want to you know step on anybody's toes here. But uh, it seems like uh, you you said you, there was a statistical there was a significant. Uh, Increase in oh, predictive I, ability. I, I mentioned that. if I can if I compare tool A, which use these eight features, with using these twenty features, we do better. Oh, okay. Now, what do doc? And this tool is actually a commercial available tool. It's a different classifier from that, but I oh. built the best we could do for that. Oh, okay, okay. Now, but let me go back to your point. Can we do better than humans? Okay, I know that's one of the themes of this class in general. Uh, the potential is there. Uh, certainly, there's a potential to look at. Yeah, and records which have millions of features, whereas physicians, well, people can't do it, and look at more data and follow trends also. Um, I don't know if you guys have looked at, you know, you know about, Je about Watson, the tool to pay Jeopardy. So the, the, there, was a, there was a program that IBM developed, using learning, learning algorithms, of course, that played Jeopardy and, and won and beat some of the world's best players. Uh, IBM is taking the same technology that scans the literature, sees what's going on, and put it, put it into a tool that's scanning the medical literature, as well as financial other things, and trying to help doctors by, by saying, did you think about this? Can I give you advice about that? Oops, do what you want, but it's kind of indicated by that. And things that might, the doctor might not have known, or might not have remembered, or maybe it just came out and it was tracking the latest, latest okay. news. So, great questions. Can we do better than, than humans? I, I think eventually that's a possibility. Are we there now? Well, for certain areas, we're doing very well. Okay. Sure. So other questions? Yeah? Uh, so uh, I think this system is, is good for the, uh, the supplement of the actual doctor. I'm sorry, louder? Uh, so I think this system is good for the supplement of uh, real doctors, and it depends on different case. If um, some disease, the diagnosis depends on a lot of data, a lot of tests. So in this case, maybe that's better than doctor, because uh, maybe uh, doctors may ignore or didn't realize some data. And uh, but this this robot, this system can compare the patient's information with the historical patients. But for some disease in surgical in surgical some surgical disease, uh, surgical treatment maybe that depend. The so diagnosis. So you said surgical diseases? Is that what you said? Uh, the, like the disease. Can I walk over there? I'm sorry. I, just, I can't hear you. Sorry. Say it again. And yes. Uh, some disease or some diagnostic, it depends on uh, complex, the, uh, complex uh, phenomena or complex the uh, yeah. test. So in that case, maybe this one going to be very hard. They need, the, they need the doctors to 
image which kind of disease it will be. But if it's like if it's just the uh, uh, the, the diagnostic uh, diagnos diagnosis with diagnosis with a lot of data, that's a good system to use. So you made a comment about difficult diseases or hard to diagnose. Is that right? So I, I actually think computers yeah. have a better chance of doing a good job with difficult to diagnose yeah, diseases. Yes, in some cases, can be it can do better job than real doctors, but in some cases, it cannot. Well. I mean, it's an open question. Uh, are there diseases that computers cannot diagnose? Uh, certainly, there's an intuition that a doctor looks at a patient and finds something there that lets him make his decision. And maybe that's true. And maybe there's something that's inherently uncomputable. I don't think so. I think that there might be fidgets that maybe you can quantify. Or maybe there's other factors that things that a doctor is observing and maybe not consciously can come out. But I also would say that a program might be able to look at all the factors and look at, you know, can look at visual information, can look at tactile information. I hadn't talked about it here, but there's just features you can imagine measuring. And now disease might be interesting combinations. It could be if A and B and C, but not D or E. And also if H is greater than three. That might be a diagnosis. It might be very hard to describe. Much of the medical literature right now is, has simple descriptions, you know, simple charts that say, if male, add three. If over 50, add two. If less than that, divide by three. And if that scores more than four, you then get treatment A. It's very simple because they have to have a person check boxes and do it. But why? Why not build it? Can I close that door? Can I close this door? Okay. Okay. We're uh, finished now, actually. So, so okay. this is... Uh the end of the session. You're, you're kind of living on borrowed time, but is there something crucial that you wanted to say? Yeah. So this is a lot like astronomy in the early years, where they're looking at a lot of data and trying to fit it. Are you using computers at all? Are you planning on putting algorithms to change model sets so that you can get the predictive for the one in 100,000? <coughs> So you're asking, can we do experimental design? Can we design what patients we should have in our training set? Is that what you're asking me? No. So for astronomy, they had the geocentric, so Earth is the center of the universe. Yeah. And then they had the solar yeah. centric, so we're going around the sun rather than yeah. everything going around the Earth. It was a change in the model that allowed to adjust to match the data. Okay. okay. Are we doing similar things? in this case, to try and change the model to match data? Well, let's be careful. Much of what I'm looking at is building classifiers, which give predictions, and hopefully correct predictions. Is the basis for their decisions the same as a doctor would use? A doctor might say, here are the features I know are important. I might get very different features and get a classifier which is better, which gives better predictive accuracy. Now, is that better or worse? If I change the model, well, I'm not sure how to answer that question. I'm not claiming, I'm not claiming that this is a model of, of how the brain works or how breast tumors metastasize. I'm not making that claim. Other people can look at my data and do derivations from that. My goal is saying, here's a tool which has predictive accuracy of 80% from this distribution. So I'm not asking the question of, am I doing the way doctors use it? Am I changing how doctors will do it? I think there will be changes. I think doctors will have, will have have cell phones or have smart tabs that don't have to just add up numbers and get more. They'll have a little, you know, here are the features, push a button and it comes back and here's the diagnosis. And that may involve complicated functions of the factors that were there, which might not be just if male add two, if under 54 subtract one, it might be more complicated than that. So we're changing a model in that sense. Is that what you're asking? Or? Yes. So we're, we're out of time. Thank you very, very much for an excellent session.